What better way to talk about Starchive than starting this video out by showing you how we use Starchive to import the Zoom video that we just recorded for our meet and greet co-founder meet and greet. So we're so sorry that you missed it, but this will just uh, show you a little bit about Starchive prior to you watching our Zoom call. Okay, if you've got any questions, please reach out to me, Peter at Starchive.io, or my co-founder and our CEO, Richard at Richard at Starchive.io. Okay, without further ado, here comes the pre-recorded Zoom call from Wednesday, September 28th. Great. All right. Well, welcome. My name is Richard Abert. I am uh, the CEO and co-founder of Starchive, and you've already been hearing from Peter. I think in my screen, he's up and to the left. <laughs> So uh, depending on where he shows up in your grid, uh, Peter is my co-founder, and really he's the brainchild and, and visionary behind uh, Star Archive. So we're excited to be here. Um, our, our goals for this call is to just provide a little bit of color about the company, about ourselves, uh, about our experience to date, uh, perhaps to show you a few things about the product, uh, to help you understand what our vision is, sort of where we're headed and why, uh, why we are so excited about this opportunity. Answer any questions you've got, which we might hold just for a little bit to kind of get you up to speed, and then make sure that we've we've answered you know all the things that you would need to know in order to consider whether or not an investment uh, in Starchive makes sense for you. Does that sound good? Does anybody have any other very specific things I didn't cover there that you know you want us to cover in this conversation today? I'll give you just a moment to unmute in case the answer is yes. All right, great. Well, so uh, why don't we get started? Um, you know, Pete, if you've if you've gone through the information on the WeFunder page, you know a little bit about the backstory, and so we won't shy away from the fact that we've been at this a while. Uh, I was reading an article just the other day about the company Figma, who was just acquired. Many of you may have seen that. And, you know, the headline was an overnight success, 10 years in the making. And that's, I feel like we're on the same train. Uh, you know, uh, Peter and I started out eight and a half years ago with one client named Bob Dylan and the Bob Dylan Music Company. And, uh, and we spent an, a number of years uh, working with major artists and archives, understanding what were the demands that they had for all of their media assets? What were the opportunities? What were the things getting in the way? And you know, you might ask yourself in this category of digital asset management, there are actually, there's a long legacy of platforms. There are many applications, probably a hundred or so that really existed before we showed up, but they were built around this idea of enterprise businesses, you know, big fortune 500 or 1000 corporations, the concept behind them was mostly around regulation and compliance and brand consistency. And so they were, they're big, expensive, cumbersome kinds of systems. And the Dylan team who clearly could afford an application like that had exactly zero interest in using them. They wanted some of the tools and power of those kinds of digital asset management platforms, but they wanted a system that was built around a very different ideology, around an idea that the thing they wanted to do was be creative with their assets, to curate those assets, to be able to remix them and recompose things and deploy them quickly into all kinds of products and opportunities. And that was such an inspiring challenge that, you know, uh, Peter settled into and then brought me in on that we went after it. And we did it for a bunch of big name folks like that. And it was people like Bob Dylan, but also other big artists like Billy Joel and Carly Simon and Leonard Cohen. So we're dating ourselves a little bit here, right? Uh, and then more modern folks, uh, you know, like uh, the Property Brothers and Lynn Momoa Miranda and, uh, and then some big organizations like Essence Magazine, but also cultural institutions like the Studs Terkel Archive and the Met and the Oklahoma Pop Museum. And what was interesting as uh, about all of these is though they had very different end goals with their media assets. You know, the Bob Dylan team was very much a commercial value proposition. Hey, we know that if we can get access to all of our content and be able to remix it and curate it in these ways, we can generate a lot of new products and opportunity and therefore money. I mean, Bob Dylan's kind of famous for saying to his manager, I don't care. I don't look back at my old stuff. Just go make me money. Right. And so, um, 
but but if you were the Studs Terkel archive or the Oklahoma Pop Museum, you have a similar body of assets, lots and lots of media things, but a very different value proposition. Your proposition is a cultural one. It's about how do we take these things and deliver them to the community in new and innovative ways that digital technology makes available. And curiously, it didn't matter that the end goals were different. The technical demands were very much the same. And so in 2019, you know, we took a step back after four years of doing this work with about 50, you know, clients were super proud to have on our, our, our uh, roster, big brand names who all trust us. And we said, you know, our technology could be, should be better, simpler, faster, more modern in a lot of ways. There's, you know, technology moves so fast, so much had happened. And we also said, we could see for the first time the emergence of blockchain technology and how it provided, and let's not get, we'll, we'll talk more maybe in the Q&A period about NFTs, but think about blockchain really as a fundamental technology change that allows very different kinds of opportunities for engagement and relationships and monetization between any two people or communities. And so we could see that that was emerging with real like things you could touch and feel, real tangible results. And we could see this, this thing that we now all refer to as the creator economy sort of exploding in many ways, thanks to the celebration and success of TikTok, which took social media and shifted it from, from most of the people on social being consumers of content to kind of everyone being participants and creators in content. And that was just the tip of the iceberg for what was happening, right? And so we said, you know, what would it take for us to serve not just dozens of really big, exciting clients that we are honored to work with, but millions of creators? What would it mean if we could give them technology they don't have today that allowed them to stay focused on being creative, not on managing their creativity, not on looking for files, not on trying to upload things to we transfer and you send it and all of the other tools that we use. And that just became so inspiring that we reframed the whole company. We rebranded from our old company brand name, which was Digital Relab. We actually used to have more than one product. We centered on the product Starchive, as you know it today, and rebranded the whole company as Starchive. And we spent about two years building it from the ground up. Every single line of code is new, philosophically doing the same thing that we were doing before, but doing it tactically in, in a very different way very modern, mostly serverless, highly performant, API-driven SaaS software that in theory, anyone can pick up and use without any help from us. I want to acknowledge that's theory, right? Like that no matter, we, we like to say that we're super proud of the software we've built and equally frustrated it isn't better yet. You know, we have a long list of things we think we should improve, attributes we want to add, new features, functions, and yet it's, leagues and bounds better than it used to be so much simpler and we're getting there and that's part of part of this engagement is learning from our community and also uh, also building relationships with our community where we're engaged more tightly and can hear from you better about what what to prioritize what's working what's not working so um that's really sort of the the backbone for why we're here. I should pause maybe for a second to ask if there's any questions and then we'll talk a little bit about the creator economy. Anyone have anything they're just itching to ask right now? All right, that's all right. So let's go on. The yeah, you start to get into my my favorite subject, Richard. I mean, I know, the, I know. The creator economy. And I, I think I think there's the big misnomer about the creator economy is that it's easy to think it's other people. It's it's, you know, especially when you look at our history as a company, you know, with these big name artists who are brand names publicly. Um, but what that ignores is that we live in a new world now where the creator economy is kind of anyone who is either using media, building media as their product, you know, they're making video, they're making music, they're making images, or who use media to deliver their information, their story, their brand, 
and therefore sell a product or service that is driven by that media, even if it's not the media itself. And so some of the examples, you know, that we put in our in our um, uh, content uh, on on the WeFunder page was 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 sort of, you know, it's it's during COVID when all yoga instructors had to stop teaching yoga in person. And so they turned to Zoom classes and then they recorded those Zoom classes. And now they have a body of content they could actually deliver to their community or to new people to do classes without them doing it in real time, right? Like that's that's part of the creator economy. That's true for a mechanic who happens to be really good at communicating how to fix things and quit working at the local shop down the street and now you know puts youtube videos about how to redo your carburetor and as a result has a big following and generates ad revenue from youtube i mean who here has gone to youtube to learn how to fix something right? <laughs> everyone everyone has and so you know what richard is really describing is something that is going to be one of the most powerful things uh, probably in the history of society to this point. Now, many of you, that's a huge statement, <laughs> that's a huge statement. So let me, let me give you a little background for it. Um, many of you might know from my biography that I actually started out as an archeologist and it was my love of music and recording and making media that really got me into some of the, the challenges with finding your files and organizing them and all sorts of stuff. And we'll talk about something I like to call the organizer's dilemma in a little bit. But I wanna kind of cast a frame of what this creator economy could actually turn out to be. And I believe with every, every ounce of my DNA, that the creator economy is gonna be far bigger than the industrial revolution. It is gonna impact our lives in ways we can't imagine. And here's one of the reasons why I'm so excited to bring Starchive to the world. See, and okay, I'm gonna date myself. So I was born in 1974, about 48 years old. And when I was in high school in the early 90s, and, and we've started to look at all the things. I mean, I liked architecture. I liked a lot of things, but I was very into music. I was very into art and I wanted to do something creative with my life. I would talk to, and I went to a fabulous high school and I would talk to my guidance counselor about my creative ambitions. And they would say, well, that's really good. But you know what you do, those are your hobbies, right? Those aren't the things you, you make a living at. Or if you're gonna make a living, you're going to be a, a broke artist, right? And you're going to have to um, uh, find some other way to make money. And that, that was terrible to hear from a young creative person who wanted to bring creations out into the world. Like that's a huge driver behind Starchive. We don't want anyone who's 16, 18, 19 years old to ever hear again that they can't make a living off of being creative. And so the creator economy isn't just the artists, they are the people on YouTube who are gonna teach you to fix, fix that clogged drain, right? They are the yoga teachers who are doing classes. They are, they're every one of us are participating in this, in this new big thing. And it is quite possible that if we look back in, um, you know, with a larger historical perspective, again, this is the archaeologist in me talking, you know, we're going to really see that in the industrial revolution, you had this class of factory owners, and you had this class of factory workers. And it was really, it was an expensive proposition to own the factory. But now digital is quite accessible. One could argue that it's virtually free to participate in, even if you don't have a device. There's so many devices around, you can still participate. And so we're moving into a, uh, a economic era where we all have factories in our heads. The creative factory, the ability to take an idea and share it with the rest of the world, to pick up a million dollar recording studio in your hand, and shoot a video that's going to go to a billion people. So this is a little bit of what the creator economy is about. Richard, I'll turn it back to you to give it a, even a little bit more color and kind of economic context as we as we figure this out. 
Yeah, so we'll just talk a little bit about where we're headed, right? So um, you see on our WeFunder page and in other places, we, com- we, we talk about ourselves. We use this sort of short form way of describing Starchive as like a Web3 enabled Dropbox for the creator economy. And we did that because there just aren't words other than for this kind of application, other than DAMS systems, digital asset management, uh, or and most people who aren't at that enter looking for those enterprise platforms aren't familiar with those terms anyway, right? So in yet it's not cloud storage like iCloud, which is simply a place to put stuff. It's 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 it is a place to put stuff that's connected to these curation and data capabilities and publishing capabilities that are empowering in a way that neither iCloud or Google Drive or Dropbox ever intended to be, right? It's not, it's just, it's not, there's anything wrong with them. They just weren't built for this. Yeah. And And, and one, one thing I just also want to add here is everybody on this call, have you created a digital file before? (laughs) Right. Everybody has. So and and you you go back just one, I just want to stay on this thread to give this a little bit of color. I mean, you could think of Dropbox and iCloud and Google Drive. They are places where you store files. And with Starchive, it is true. Starchive is a place to store files. But the kind of thing that we're also really introducing to the market is, hey, imagine if everything you created was in a central place that over time, it it, it could be preserved and shared. See, we're at the very beginning of all of this digital. And so many of us have lost hard drives, phones, devices, and all of these things. And so what Starchive wants to do is not just give you the functionality of other digital asset management systems uh, like Google Drive, Dropbox, and, and a lot more expensive ones in those free versions, but it wants to give you something like this peace of mind, this, this experience where you, where you really are like, oh, I know where everything is. I've got a record of everything. Yeah. yeah. So our, our aim, our, our purpose in the world, as Peter said, is to make it possible for people to stay in their creative zone and bring more creativity into the world. That's really where value is created. That's joy. That's entertainment. That's experience. That's education. It's all the things that all of us love and and thrive. And the way we seek to do that is by creating an asset management platform that that is assisting you in creating the connections between your assets and giving you the ability to curate those assets in in really very free and flexible ways so that you can deploy them then to different opportunities. And whether that's publishing them to traditional social like Facebook or YouTube or whatever, or whether that is in the future, um, putting them on your own Web3 domain and and, and giving all of your fans a uh, an NFT that is basically an access token to access that content on your domain. It's all about making it possible for you to connect with pe- with your fan and community more directly and more discreetly where you are in charge and you are the owner of those assets. So, you know, Peter talks about preservation and preservation for an individual is about how do I keep and store and manage my things and have my peace of mind. Preservation for a brand or an artist is about staying relevant in the public's eye. And so in order to do that, we live in a world where that being relevant in the public's eye is driven by media content today. It's not driven by the written word anymore, right? And and it's because media is so powerful that we've all embraced it so so much. Uh, And and it it makes people like brands. I don't know how many of you have heard of Mr. Beast. He's sort of this not everybody on this call will have heard of him, I'm sure, but Mr. Beast is this YouTube phenomenon who built up a huge following doing originally small stunts and the stunts got bigger and bigger and bigger. And he just got massive, millions and millions of followers. Mr. Beast then expanded and he started selling Mr. Beast sweatshirts and hats and tennis shoes and other branded gear. And recently he opened a burger joint. And I think something like it was more than 3,000 people were waiting in line to buy a burger, a Mr. Beast burger, right? So is Mr. Beast a person or a brand or a company? He's kind of all of the above. And part of what's happened in this digital evolution is we've significantly blurred the lines between, between what it is to be a business, what it is to be a person, and where those things 
you know, co are kind of commingled, right? Our identity is bound up in these experiences and expressions of ourself in many ways. And I guess I should have pointed out, Peter pointed out, he's a creative. For anybody who doesn't know, I started out my uh, career in fine arts and art history. My degree is in photography, and I was a commercial photographer because it's hard to make a living as a fine arts photographer. And so, you know, I, I lived this problem for many years and still, still do as well, which is part of why we feel so passionate about it. So I want to make sure we move along and get to some Q&A here. So the, the, where we're headed is that today Starchive is, a, is still an early manifestation of what we want it to be. We've got the storage thing locked down. We've got data. We have really refined data capabilities. We have the first experience of AI in there with our object recognition helping you sort of tag your photos and things. But just last night, I was on a call with a group out of the Middle East who's built an extraordinary platform that is helping you with no code link together AI tools because the vision that we have is that as compute costs come down and, and these uh, systems get more um, responsive and more elegant and easy to use, you should be able to put all your videos into a, an application like Starchive and have it tag every person along the timeline, every event, every, every object, uh, make a transcript, translate that transcript if you want, and even give you sentiment analysis on it, right? Like identify if it's sad or happy. So that when you think about it, your mind, in your mind, you already know these things about your content. But in a sea of digital assets, it's very difficult for you to say, I need to find all my videos where that, that kind of have a happy sentiment and that have a tricycle in them, right? That's a nearly impossible problem for most of us today. Big companies can do it with powerful and expensive AI, but that's coming down and it's coming to the masses. And so our vision for the future is that we will continue to expand into the data augmentation side of this to make it easier and easier and easier for all of us to simply use compute power and AI to give us uh, data about our assets that helps build those connections. And I know, I think I know where you're going, Pierce. Let me say one more thing. I want to make sure we get to it. It should be really clear that AI can be a scary uh, bit of language. And sometimes people are worried about it and it's, it has a lot of privacy implications. I want to be really clear. We put, I think we put on one of our things in WeFunder as well, that it's day, it's it's AI that, su that it, it supports you, that helps you, but not that exploits you. We will never take your data about your assets or you and share it with anyone, anywhere, for any reason, period, full stop. We can't see it unless you invite us to see it and we don't sell it. We don't even know what it is. So, you know, that, that has some limitations. It means, uh, for example, I'm looking at Rob here on the screen. We won't be able to go through Rob's whole catalog and say, these are all the pictures of Rob Jackson. But we will be able to say all of these faces are person number one. You can then rename them and call them Rob. Because what we're not going to do is go share that information out in the web in a way that exposes that privacy issue. So, and we don't want you all doing that to our data as well, right? I mean, this is this is what this is about. This is what it means to build software with community, right? Is that mutual respect? Yeah. So... Uh, let me get quickly to why are we crowdfunding? I mean, you know, one of the things you all will have seen is, is that, you know, we've actually raised a lot of money over the years. I'm proud to say we've raised $5.7 million to this point. Um, and, and some of that includes some institutional VCs. There's a couple of big private family offices and a whole bunch of smaller early stage, you know, families, friends, angel investors, all kinds of stuff who've been part of that. Um, some of that money was raised in our older business model, right? So, so some of that uh, helped us through those early days of evolution with the big artists before we reframed the company around this new uh, strategy and ideology. Um, and so we, as we come into this uh, interesting period in the economy and everything, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of chaos. A lot of venture capital uh, are being... I would say aggressively sharky, right? They know that they know the economy's depressed. So they're trying to push on small companies and say, hey, if you want to raise money, we're going to make you pay dearly for it. 
Um, we've had a lot of people in our community say, hey, how can we participate? So much of what we saw happen in the last decade was, was about um, savvy venture capitalists and a handful of lucky founders make a ton of money off of all of the energy and effort of all of us, right? As we put things in Facebook and Instagram or whatever, you know, the people who invested in those companies and the founders of those companies are, are doing great. They're making a lot of money on our energy and effort. And a big piece of what's happening in the, in the creator economy shift is to say, hey, how do we share that equity more broadly across all of us? And so this community raise has three goals for us. First and foremost, it's making sure that we walk the walk, that we make space for the users of our product to participate in the success that we generate together over time, right? We think that's huge. And if you can only get in after the IPO, most of us know you've already missed the big gains. And so this is about making sure that we make room for all, the, all of us who maybe aren't accredited investors, maybe don't have an opportunity to write big checks uh, to get in. I see there's a question down there in the bottom. Let me, I'm just gonna make sure. Oh, uh, Dana, we're we're using, yes, just to be clear so that we answer your question, we are using WeFunder as the platform. And yes, this is a Reg CF raise. Um, so, uh, so, so first, making sure we make room for our community is paramount to us. Second, this is a great opportunity for us to establish a more direct connection with our user community and our investor community, where we can get tighter feedback uh, yeah. critical feedback about how we can be better. We like to wake up every day and say, hey, if we're so good, how come we're not better yet, right? Like there's, it is, we're on, a, on a, a, a strategy of perpetual improvement and having a, a relationship with a broader group of people who will use the product and share honest feedback with us gives us uh, more resilience as a company. Uh, and lastly, there's a great opportunity for us in this to build a, a you know, sort of a trusted, loyal group of people who will also have skin in the game and will tell their friends about Starkai, right? It's a great way for us to build, build an, a group of ambassadors who will go out and help us grow. So that's sort of our means for doing it. Um, we are also, we also do expect to raise more money in the future uh, from the traditional investor community. We're not, but you will see as we get our audited financials finished, and filed in our form C filed, all of you will have an opportunity to look at those and understand where we are. We are not profitable yet. Um, our strategy to get profitable is to grow to at least 250,000 users and convert 3% of those, which would be about on par with uh, Dropbox to paying subscribers at $9.90 some odd cents a month, so about $120 a year, right? That gets us over a million dollars a year in annual recurring revenue, which is an industry metric for being ready for a growth style Series A. And so just very tactically, that the, the use of funds from this will be to invest in our user growth and our, and our development to get us to that next milestone. I'm proud to say that today, we rolled over 85,000 total accounts uh, with at least one account in every country in the world. So we're global already and we're growing. And most importantly about that 85,000, that's, that's up from 5,000 a year ago. So that's pretty exceptional growth. But it's also in May, we stopped advertising because it was important for us to understand, you know, Will we grow organically? Do we have network effect and word of mouth happening? And since we turned off the advertising without spending a single penny, we've added over 16,000 new accounts. So we've got, we've got that ball rolling and we're really excited about it. If you can imagine how that gets exponentially bigger as those numbers grow, you know that we've got a flywheel here for ourselves. Can, so, can I ask a yeah. question, Richard? Yeah, sure. So... Um, I'll preface this by saying at a previous business, I had a social network and um, one of the investors said, Tyler, this is not a social network. I said, well, what do you mean? It's a social network. Look, it's set up just like Facebook. It's a social network. He goes, if it's a social network, how come it's not viral? 
And my heart sank because I knew he was 100% correct. It wasn't viral. This has already become viral. That's one point. And the second point, can you explain the Canva integration? Because that's an integration with only one software company, and there's hundreds out there that we can also do the exact same thing with. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Tyler. So in April, uh, do you all know what Canva is? I don't know. I, I, a lot of you I can't see, so I'll, I'll trust that if you if the answer is no, you'll speak up and let me know. But Canva is like is kind of like Photoshop for lay people, and they have built an extraordinary business. They're out of Australia. Melanie Perkins is the founder. It's will probably be the biggest IPO ever uh, for a female founder, which is super exciting. Um, and their, their platform is incredible. It's super easy to use. It has a freemium version as well. They have 75 million monthly active users. They are probably uh, going to IPO for something in the 30 or $40 billion range when they do. So we plugged in a very simple integration to Canva that allowed a user in Canva who creates a new PDF or a new video or something to save it into Starchive, even if they didn't have a Starchive before. In that process, it sort of automatically creates a Starchive for them and they create an account and they have an opportunity to grow with us. I will tell you that I'm, I, love the, I love the integration and today, it's still kind of hard to find. Like you have to, you have to go looking for it in Canva. You've got to build a thing and then decide you don't have a good place to save it and look at their more connected apps button. And, you know, so we've not yet done a big newsletter promotion or something exciting to tell the whole Canva community about it. And yet we've had 12,700 uh, users since April 4th create an account in Starchive through Canva. So there's massive opportunity there. I actually emailed the head of strategic partnerships at Canva yesterday, somebody that we're connected to, um, uh, talking to him about this idea of what does it take for us to promote this broadly to the Canva community? Because if you think about it, effectively, I, mean, I can't say every Canva user, but the vast majority of Canva users are perfect fits for Starkai. Well, and Richard, no, Richard, I yeah. think we can say this definitively about oh. every the user in the in this sense don't you care about your creations i mean if you make something don't you want to save it right i mean that you kind of have to oh. so though it might not be all 65 million i, I grant that <laughs> but that we do want to keep these things we don't want to lose them yeah so 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 we are, we're very bullish on that opportunity and there are mm. dozens of other applications right. that are in the creator economy that we expect to integrate with our huge push in the next 12 months is to build those integrations out. Um, so we have a pretty good, we do a pretty good job today with the publishing side, meaning publishing to social and stuff, particularly from mobile. Um, but we want to create the other, the connections in the other way. So when creators are creating things, it's super easy for them, instead of saving them to their desktop or their phone or wherever, and then uploading them into Starcraft, we want to make that move lateral directly into the application. So that's a, and it's not diff, it's not difficult to do. It's just, you, it takes a little time and resources to get it right and to do it well. And we're staying very focused on simplicity and elegance. So I want to cover one last thing, and then maybe we'll open it up to uh, uh, some questions and maybe even showing you a few things in the product. It keeps coming up. Many of you on this call may already know the difference between a reservation and an investment, but there's a lot of confusion about this, the requirements around uh, Reg CF and crowdfunding. And we are currently in what they call the testing the waters phase of this crowdfund. And what that means is we have not yet filed what the SEC requires is called a Form C. And a Form C can only be filed with current audited financials and a few other things. And so we've been going through the process of auditing our financials right now. It's just about done so that we can uh, submit those to WeFunder create and file the Form C and share those audited financials very transparently with each and every one of you and anyone who wants to see them before you make an investment. So today, what's happening is you're making a reservation for an investment, meaning you're saying, hey, if there's only a half a million dollars they're going to offer and they might run out of it, I want to hold a spot for myself for 500 or 1000 or $5,000, whatever it is. 
the if you if you do that today and you fund that investment, that money goes straight to WeFunder and it sits in escrow, totally protected, 100%. And when we file our Form C, uh, after that's filed and all of you can have a chance to see it, then we can flip the switch from taking reservations to taking investments. At that stage, uh, WeFunder will be asking anyone who hasn't yet funded their investment to decide, do they want to fund yes or no? And anyone who has funded their investment, are you still happy and satisfied and do you want to make this investment? So there's an opportunity, even with your reservation, to say, no, after looking at all the details, I don't think this is a fit for me. I'm going to back out. No, no harm done. You'll get all your money back. Then the investment itself will be held by WeFunder until we hit at least our minimum goal. Our goal for this campaign is a half a million dollars, but when we get to our minimum threshold of 250,000, we could choose to do start a rolling close. Then what that means is we would we funder would go back out to each and every one of you and say, "Hey, they've not hit their maximum goal yet, but they've hit their minimum goal. Are you comfortable with them actually with us actually transferring your money to Starchive the company now?" and them beginning this rolling close while they'll continue to take investments over a few more months or a year, depending on what some people have done, rolling closes for two years. We don't anticipate that, but I just want to give you the, the, the range. Um, and you have a chance again at that moment to say yes or no. And if you say yes, that would be the first moment that your money would ever be at risk and transferred to StarCop. So I just want to make it really clear what's happening and also the protections for you, the community, in this process. Because this, you know, the, the, the beauty of a Reg C process is that it's very transparent by, by regulation. So you will know everything about our company you want to know and, 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 uh, and make sure that you're comfortable with that investment in advance. Are there any questions about that? Because that's a, that's a big, complicated topic area. I'll give just a minute. If you're asking anything you're, and you're muted, make sure you unmute. Looks like Sarah has her hand up. Yes. Hey, um, so when it, when the money is transferred, um, if you if you decide to do it at the minimum amount raised or the 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 maximum of the five hundred thousand, will the will the investment be converted into shares? How how will we know what? What what part of a, the investment we have in Starchive if we're if we're investing? Yeah, that's a great question, Sarah. So um, the anyone who comes through the WeFunder community campaign is investing in something called an SPV or special purpose vehicle. It is a roll up of all of the investors, and that vehicle has a sort of has its own uh, you know tax ID number and comes onto our our cap table as a single line item representing all of the people in this group. There will be one lead investor out of the, the SPV who represents everyone in terms of any voting rights or other things in any future decision-making processes that might come along with that bucket of shares. Um, we will, before we are allowed to begin taking investments, we will identify for each of you who that lead investor is. And uh, you'll get some background on them. We'll probably have an opportunity to host another Zoom, get to meet them. And they will be sort of a representative for the whole. But to be clear, there won't, there, there is not a lot of voting power in uh, that comes along with this community raise. That doesn't mean there's not a lot of influence. Influence will be that relationship that we want to build with each and every one of you. And we care more about what our community says about the product and the decisions we make than we do, as you can imagine, about uh, a, a more detached investor. Um, but that, So that's how you come, come in, how you will know what you get. You're investing in something called a safe note. And a safe note is a debt instrument uh, that that will convert to actual shares at a future financing. It is the, the safe note is capped at 20 million, which means if we blow this thing up and we raise a future round from venture capitalists at 40 million dollars, you all would be buying in at 50 cents on the dollar. 
right? Your, your investment would come in uh, at capped at 20 million. If we, if we raise money in the future at 15 million, uh, instead of 20 million or 30 million or something, you are also protected because the safe note will convert at the lower number or at the cap, plus there's a discount on it. So you're gonna get a 12% discount on that number. So think of that as like going to the store and buying something and getting guaranteed a 12% discount. And you might get a much bigger discount depending on what that future raise is. Does that make sense to everyone? I probably have some people who are sophisticated on here and know some of this and some who don't, but I wanna make sure. I am, By the way, I am not a lawyer. Um, WeFunder has a lot of really good information that probably does a better job explaining this than I do, but that's the lay terms for as, as we understand them. That makes sense? Great. Yes, on some levels, but no on others, but um, maybe I can <laughs> to check out the WeFunder platform and see what what I can learn from that. Yeah, yeah, and feel free to reach out and ask questions. We'll do our best. We'll make sure that we get you every answer we can. And we can get you with a WeFunder expert if we're not care if we're not capable of getting you an answer that makes it clear. Hey, Richard. Yes, Michael. Just real quick, a higher level um, related to that is, so are you saying essentially that this fund will be $500,000 on a $20 million valuation? Uh, uh, at, at a maximum of $20 million valuation. That's the, that's yeah. the intention. That's the, right. The vision. But, so that's that leaves so half a million dollars on. So it's one fortieth of the company. Uh, blah, blah. That's that correct. Right? That's correct. If so we, this whole fund, if someone just comes in a whole five hundred, they're buying one fortieth of the company. Just to I'm trying. I'm, I don't know if that was the level of the question. Uh, that's super helpful, Michael. Thank you. I should I should have said that. You're right. <clears throat> Other questions about this or comments? I will say, Michael, that they are getting 100% of the gratitude of every person <laughs> that's involved with Starchive. Only, only 100? <laughs> oh, only, <laughs> you caught me. You caught me and you know me so well. 1,000%. A million. <laughs> the fact is, we, we, we are so excited about Starchive. There's so much potential in this. The timing is really perfect. COVID has been really difficult uh, in pretty much every... Um, sense of the word. But the thing that it has done for each of us is really forced on this entire, it's accelerated the creator economy. It's accelerated digital. I mean, we were joking at the beginning of this call, this is not everybody's first Zoom call. And, you know, we haven't even gotten into some of the things uh, around Web3 and, you know, where where the future of kind of like community and, and you know, internet, uh, the collaboration is really going but yeah there's just so much and we're going to be we're going to be doing a lot of these kind of meet and greets because there's so much we want to show and, and and tell so that's right and and to the extent it's 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 possible any one of you who wants to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with us just reach out yeah. uh, we're happy to do that i think we've sent out a calendly link uh um and and or we'll, we will if you want if if you want to have a call we're happy to talk to you um, why don't we take a minute? Are there, are there other questions right now? Does anyone want to raise their hand and ask? And if not, what we may do is just show you a couple of things in the platform, because maybe not all of you is, have actually seen Starchive live. No other questions are jumping up? Give just a moment. All right, Peter. Do, yeah. you want to, do you want to start that and show oh, a couple? Oh yeah, I'd, I'd love to. Let me go ahead and uh, I'll share my screen here. Give me just one second. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully each of you are on a device that allows you to uh, to see Peter's screen. All right. Uh, so, okay, hopefully, yeah, you can see it. Basically, Starchive is a web application and it's a mobile application. It's a little harder on Zoom uh, to actually demo the mobile app for you, but Starchive is super easy to sign up for. And so what I'm going to do is uh, just show you a little around the uh, sh uh, around the web application. Uh, and Richard, if you wanted to either, uh, uh, well, I guess it, this would be on our, our WeFunder page. If you want to go and sign up for your own Starchive, kick the tires, play with it. We have a freemium model to this application. And you could either go to starchive.io or signup.starchive.io. 
and you just need an email address and uh, put your name in and you'll spin up your star archive. Uh, I've, I'm a member of a few different star archives. And so what I'll do you is I'll, I'll show you around the kind of the star archive demo. And while we're doing this, let's start with uploads so we can kind of get some new files going. So what I've done is I've just kind of clicked on the upload button. We could import uh, files from Dropbox or Google Drive, uh, OneDrive, even the Zoom call could be imported directly into Starkive. But I've got a few files sitting here on my desktop. So let me go into some, uh, where's my sample files? And I'm gonna grab, how about these, um, I'll grab these two uh, folders right here. And I'm just gonna drop them into Starkive. And as you can see, these two folders were about 194 megs, uh, 21 different files. And I can do things, I can close that and I can navigate around. So um, while this is uploading, uh, why don't we look at one of these files? And actually, you know what? I'm gonna expand this uh, so that we can go into a, a more of an expanded view. Um, so what we're doing is we're looking at a GoPro video that was uploaded to Starkive. And this is like the details record of it, right? And if I, uh, because I've opened up 26 different files, you know, I could easily move around these things. But let's let's go back to this particular video because I think this this uh, video, this this picture of a uh, 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 woman in a canoe, really describes kind of the. It's a good way to understand what Starkive can really do, and it addresses what we like to call the organizer's dilemma. Now, what do I mean by the organizer's dilemma? Well, specifically, what I really mean is that when you have a file or a group of files that are sitting in a folder, you really feel the pain of the organizer's dilemma because, well, what happens if I want to have the same file in a different folder, right? You know, we've all gone through this experience where maybe you're trying to um, choose some favorite pictures, right? And if you're just dealing with uh, dumb storage or a folder, what that ends up doing is duplicating files. And now you've got multiple folders with some versions of all of these different files in it. And that leads to like loss of, um, uh, uh, you know, it leads to confusion. You know, we're not sure which the original is. You know, you start to have all of this storage that you don't need. It's very bloated. And so Starchive does support folders, right? You know, because they, they are part of the way we think. You know, folders aren't an evil thing. They're just one of the ways that we think of things. And they're great for expressing hierarchy and for expressing um, uh, uh, the, here, I'll just go into this to kind of really drill down. We're looking at folder view in Starchive. Oops, uh, maybe uh, look at this particular uh, folder thing. So, Everybody's probably experienced this, right? Folders inside folders inside folders. And Starchive will do a great job of that. In fact, you can drag folders exactly, you know, uh, into Starchive and it will recreate all of this necessary folder structure. But let's face it, our brains are not wired as folders. They, you know, they're very association driven. And uh, metadata, right, from the Greek word meta, meaning self-referential or beyond, metadata is information about information. It's data about data. And so in Starchive, to solve this thing I was calling the organizer's dilemma, you're like, well, how do I organize it? You know, I might organize this by, you know, this is an outdoor scene or there's a, a, a canoe in this, or this is a video, or this was, you know, created on uh, August the 23rd of 2019. And so what we're doing in Starchive is we're providing lots and lots and lots of different ways to organize and kind of create relationships between files. So there's a few different ones. We have artificial intelligence, like Richard described earlier. And in Starchive, we call them auto tags. We have human uh, uh, information. We call that tags and we call that custom fields. And for example, with auto tags, the, the uh, uh, Amazon recognition tagged this, the, the thumbnail in this video as vessel, rowboat, vehicle, person, canoe, et cetera. So if I click on boat, I am now going to go into Starchive independent of my folder structure 
and I'm going to find all of the different boats that I've uploaded. Now, that's just one way to look at things, and we call them auto tags. And so by clicking on a different view, which is going to show me all of my auto tags, you can see that this particular Starkive, even though it had like less than, you know, 10,000 files in it, it found over 1,300 unique auto tags. And so if I start to scroll down, I see landscapes, I see fruit. Okay, well, what fruit did it find in Starkive? Lots of different fruits, right? And therefore, if I uh, jump on this particular image, it found blueberry, person, food, plant, human, because it was an arm. So when, because we're creating so many files, this is really important. Important. I want to find all the pictures of, of a blueberry, right? If I go back to this particular video, and I'm going to open, expand it again, you'll see that the same sort of paradigm exists with what we call tags. And this tag, sky, jill, canoe, these are just normal, simple, you know, comma separated values. And uh, uh, we could, we could um, uh, tag it anything and create a view. But where Starkive really excels is mapping this unique data, this human data, your data, to files so that basically it can bind together these relationships on how you think. And we call these custom fields. So if we were going to talk product differentiation, why are you different than Dropbox? Why are you different than Google Drive or OneDrive? It is mainly because those systems either don't allow you to tag at all or only provide the most basic simple tagging uh, to tag your files. I'll give you an example. Uh, in, in a lot of creative circles, you have to get approval you know, uh, uh, from a client before you can release things and things go through multiple different versions. I created a custom field called approved by client and notice it has a checkbox that's true. Okay, I'm gonna click on true. And now what I'm gonna see here are all of the files that have been, it, it, like search tells the story, show me all my files, that the that the have been approved by the client, it's true. Well, hey, what hasn't been approved by the client? Let's choose false. All of these haven't been approved. And so if I go back to this video, uh, and we'll, we'll go back to the expanded uh, view here, you can see that I have a number of different custom fields. I have custom fields that relate to dates. I've got credits, I've got projects. And we thought it was really important based on our own experience and working with customers that the way that they thought, the information about it went with along with these assets. And, hey, and Peter, can I, can I jump in for just a second? Absolutely. I know we're going to run out of time soon. Yeah. There's so many things to show you. And Peter identified that the data is a differentiator. There's a lot of other differentiators as well, like the fact that you can preview uh, videos without moving them and share them with people without moving them, even at massive scale, uh, you can, you know, we have, we're integrated with blockchain technology. So that same data that you're seeing there can also be smart contract data. And all of that is native to the application. So, uh, so, uh, but, but I think that key to this is this idea that the application gets smarter every time you use it. And by that, I mean, Every time you add a new file to Starchive, it the data that's within that file is probed. The AI adds data, and then and then the human may or may not add data. But all of that data is then connected to every other asset that shares any one of those values. So there's this idea of auto curation happening, yeah, all the time inside the application, and so it actually gets richer and richer and richer as you go along, which is uniquely different from most of the other applications in the kind of cloud storage organization space. And so Starchive is built to help you find the, the unexpected, the signal and the noise, the opportunity that was hidden before, because it starts to emerge out of the data, which makes the connection that tells a story. That's a key piece of it. But Peter, let's pause. We're, we're yeah. three minutes from the end here. And I wanna be sure that if anybody has questions, we, we can do another one where we show Starchive all day long if people want, or if you want a deeper dive, because we yeah. love it and there's lots of features. But how about a uh, quick Q&A? And I'll stop just sharing my screen here for a second. We can always yeah. pop it on if we wanted to. Anyone have any questions?
or any comments? So are you more or less excited now? <laughs> <laughs> Rob seems to be saying more. All right. I'm stoked. Great. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Swami Pranana. This is something that feels solves a lot of problems all together, like um, the organization, the fact that you can save a folder structure, but like have like a visual search. And, you know, I, I met, I've been like, I'm a historical Flickr user. I remember when I was entering tags manually and it was like a labor of love. And Yeah, right. So, and things didn't improve much in the last 10 years. Yeah, you have like some auto-generated tags or auto-generated organization, but um, it's only the, like, yeah, you, you have cats and dogs and people, those are <laughs> easy. But like if you do something just a little bit out of, you know, not taking portraits of your family members or picture of food, like those things quickly fall apart. So right. I'm really excited about this functionality you just showed. So. Well, thank, thank you, you so much. We, we, we feel like we're at the very beginning of this uh -huh. in terms of what we can do and where the market's going and where the tools are going, et cetera. So, so you know, we're hungry for that feedback to, to help us improve. Mm -hmm. And and uh, uh, Dana, if you're still there, I, I I think I accidentally sent you a direct message when I intended to send one to respond to Swami, uh, who said she'd love an all day tour. And I said, well, let's set it up. <laughs> so I apologize that that came straight to you. It was meant for everyone. Um, but yeah, we'd be happy to do more tours. Uh, re reach out and let us know. Any other comments or questions? We can stay longer. I just wanted to be mindful of the time uh, for everyone else. I there's have a one question. thing. I, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say there's a question from Peter about metadata. Oh, in the sure. chat. Great. Uh, let's 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 take a look at that. Um, sorry, Peter, I didn't see it. Uh, okay, so uh, great informed question about IPTC metadata, typically a news standard, right? You know, as as it, it came up, and um, you know the old adage of uh, there's so much metadata, it's hard to choose, you know, between all of the options. We've taken the all and approach. Every metadata is valid, including no metadata, if you really just want to wipe your files and not have any metadata into it. So in terms of IPTC data, any intrinsic metadata uh, that's that comes with the file, Starchive's going to probe out of it. And we're doing some uh, some work under the hood right now to better connect all of those things. I mean, Richard as a, prof uh, a professional photographer realizes that some of these lenses, right, actually come with unique serial numbers. And we've solved problems. This isn't IP, this isn't part of the IPTC standard. So, you know, whether it's EXIF, IPTC, you know, or any of the other flavors of, of embedded file metadata, we're gonna, we're gonna improve it or, or we're gonna, we're gonna extract it. I mean, our goal is to just know everything about the file. And again, to just kind of pump the tagline because we want you to do more creating. Yeah. You know, yeah, I, I think to, to simplify that, we do current, if, if, the, if the data is embedded in the file record, we extract it and display it. One of the things we're working to do, uh, when you start dealing with all of the embedded metadata, there can be more than about 15,000 different variants of that. And as you can imagine, one of the challenges, some of those, are really quality stuff like IPTC data, which has discrete values. Some of it is kind of uh, technical nonsense that the devices create and that you really can't use for anything meaningful. So one of the things we're working on is a bit of an editorial approach to looking at all of that probe metadata, not getting rid of any of it, but, but choosing certain, like sort of identifying which data is of higher class and value and therefore gets added and linked in the data record versus the data that's available to you, but may not be hot linked because it just starts to pollute the performance of the application at scale. And then in the future, fe the feature futures, I like to talk about it. We want your custom field metadata to be written into the file. But hey, yeah. it's, this is an evolution, right? Of kind of just moving through these various releases as improvement. Great. Rob, you had a question? Uh, more of a comment, uh, or I guess it could be a question. Um, 
one of the things that I really, I've been enamored with Starchive and all that kind of stuff ever since I learned about it from Richard, I don't know what, three, four years ago. I don't even know how long it was. But when I talk to people about it, I'm really kind of talking to the legacy creators, not the creative, creative economy that's emerging, but the people who have been creators for a long time, who have goo gobs of content, and they know they need to organize it, but they haven't taken that step to become organizers. So yeah. they're still in production mode, right? And there's got stuff all over the place and it's chaos. And some people are losing stuff, but I'm not sure how to make that switch or turn that switch on for them so that they can actually jump in. They know they need the tool. They know they want the tool, but for whatever reason, they just can't get organized. And mm -hmm. whether it's people on their team that they need to hire, they don't want to dedicate people on their team to doing the organizing because they want to do it themselves. So yeah. my, my whole can thing Can I answer is, that? Please, I, I would love to, to hear what other people okay. are experiencing in this space. Okay, you're, you're looking at one of the most unorganized creatives in the free world, okay? <laughs> and I have literally 13 years of a podcast that I did every single day, okay? I have so much media and it, I just, I'm not, I'm not, I don't think linearly in any way, shape or form. All you do, is you drop all your media in there. And then the most, and I wanted to say this earlier, but I didn't want to interrupt. The most fun thing about Starchive is to watch the AI do its tricks. It is unbelievable. And it's very hard for you to get your, your mind around that you don't need folders because you're so wed to the folder world. And, but you just, you, you and, and, even if the AI isn't perfect and it, and it misnames something, you remember that because because yeah. you and we used to call Starchive used to say it works like a human brain. It really does, because you start looking at the tags and you're like, oh, you look at tag at that. Oh, look, that tag, this, this tag, that. And you go away and you're like, where's that picture of my kid when he was 12 years old with the BB gun in the backyard? Oh, yeah, it tagged it BB. I remember that. You're, you're, if you just spend any modicum of time going over your, your, your content, you remember it and you can find it. It's, it's so much easier to find stuff than it is going through hard drives and spreadsheets. And it's, the answer is just do it. It's like Nike, baby. <laughs> yeah. It, I, I, thank you, Tyler. That's awesome. I, I would say this too, Rob. It, it, is an, it is a huge problem. If you asked us what was one of our bar biggest barriers to people's adoption, it's that we, it's sort of like cleaning your garage or your closet, right? You, you know you're going to be happy with the results and you'll do it tomorrow. You know, um, and it's always tomorrow. But uh, part of the magic of Starchive, and we need to continue to tell this story better, is is that unlike you don't have to make all those organization decisions up front. You don't have to say, "Am I going to organize by out? Am I going to alphabetize it, or am I going to do it by year, or am I going to do it?" You literally can dump it all in like your big box of Legos and let the system then say, "Okay, now show me all the red ones." Show me all the green ones. And yeah, you'll find things that, that don't give you all of the information you want, but, but yeah. it's super simple to be able to add tags or categories of tags or custom fields to then further hone those curations into subsets. But you've, you're right. You got to convince people to try it, right? It's that's, that is, that is, uh, I would say that's one of the greatest barriers to adoption. Yeah. And Richard, I'm intimidated by that. I want to I want to add one thing really quick. While I'd like to answer Peter's question about transcribing video because I think it goes a lot to what Rob's talking about. And then while I'm doing that, there's Carter had a fat super smart question about Canva and their IPO and things and we could, we could speak about that. But so Rob and Peter, <clears throat> you know, you know the the phrase you know, we don't have time for these things. I mean, don't you want to hang out with your friends? You don't want to go tag these things. You know I mean? That's the, you know, this is not, we, I don't know people who wake up in the morning and go, I just can't wait to di manage my digital assets. That doesn't happen. Maybe for some curators, but but it, for, for most everybody, it doesn't. So what we are doing, and, and, and Peter, this gets to your question about transcribing video, right? 
what Starkive does today, and this it, there's a lot of room that we've left to grow this product and to do these things. What Star, the promise that Starkive wants to make, this feature promise, this future feature promise, is look, just create. I even think uploads a barrier. It should just know where you're creating and those files should show up in Starkive. Then that's like our integration paths, right? Through Canva, through social media, all of these things. Now, Peter was asking a very specific question about transcribing videos, right? And um, again, if you are searching for video content, you know, someone to tag all of that, if you're shooting hours and hours and hours of video every day, that's like kind of a, that's an impossible task. And yet the video itself has what you're wanting to search for. So, so in Starkive, we have a number of these application pieces that all come together to become the platform. One of them is, you know, the, the UI, the UX experience that, you know, I showed you a little bit of. But there's some things that are going on behind the scenes which aren't very obvious. When you upload files, we do a few things. We're going to extract all that embedded metadata. We're going to learn about the file from its size, its format, you know, all that kind of stuff. We're going to know where it fit into the hierarchy based on the, the folders. And then there's something that we have a, a layer, it's called the ETL layer or our pipeline, the edit transform layer, right? And so Peter, right now, the cost of, to, to, to Starkive, the, the cost that we would pass on to other people at our basic uh, and free level to transcribe video, it's just, it's not really cost prohibitive. Right, you don't want every single video that you are uploading to be transcribed. But our uploader, our pipeline, the thing that like the files get uploaded and they go through before they show up, it has the ability to tap into virtually any type of Linux, Unix, or API process. And we have for different clients like um, run through a lot of uh, trans. Right. By the way, this is version three, as Richard mentioned, as technology is involved, we would do the hard thing to say, you know what, we're going to just burn version two, we're not going to use it at all, we're going to rewrite new code. And so we're in the process of adding some new features. But with um, the, the whether it's transcription, or maybe you have, you, you're, you're trying to put new language subtitles in it, so you can open up different markets. The idea here is really that a single storage repository where these files are preserved in their original format so that they could be automatically transformed into anything. And you know, we're talking about videos here. Let's keep in mind, <clears throat> an hour long video is also 100,000 images sequenced together, right? And so each of these, whether you're running AI processes on it. So what we're, you know, I would say that we're not gonna introduce video transcription prior to closing this WeFunder raise. But I will say a couple of years ago when Essence Magazine, when COVID hit and one of our clients, Essence Magazine, uh, had a, what Richard, what do they have like? Uh, yeah, I, I could jump in. Essence, five, had, uh, yeah. Essence had 6,000 hours of historical film footage. And when COVID hit and they had to cancel Essence Fest in person and had to go virtual, yeah. they needed to figure out how to prep content for that in three months. And they had no data with this historical footage, but it was all in Starkive. So, and actually this speaks to a question that Kim Sun Lee asked uh, about uh, about who owns the 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 uh, the uh, the IP for the AI. That we, might have been Carter who asked it, but oh, or or, or yeah. there's a couple of them. Kim Sun Lee sent a direct message to me. So, oh, okay. uh, so in any case, these are these all tie together. But the point is, with Essence, what we did is under the hood, we ran all six thousand hours against a celebrity recognition AI engine in about eight days and gave them back the results along the timeline, so they could produce content for Essence Fest, which collectively got almost 5 billion views. So extraordinarily successful. We've done other projects with them since. What's important is what Peter was saying here is that Starkive is an API driven application built of microservices. And it's designed so that it can connect to other API driven applications, which is what we did with Canva. And it's what we do with, with uh, you know, Facebook or Instagram or Zoom even to record a, a video uh, uh, call. Yeah. In the future, 
we would like to make uh, to expand the AI capabilities. We actually talked early in this call about a company in the Middle East we're partnering with right now, uh, exploring this, where a user could say, I want to choose these 1,000 files, and I want to run them against these AI processes and get these results back, and that all of that would happen then automatically. I'll tell you what's hard about that is, as Peter was hitting on, is that there are cost considerations for each of those AI engines. And then there are technical in, in, uh, considerations, like if I need a transcript, Peter, that I then need to translate into another language, and then I then want to use sentiment analysis along in the other language, that is totally doable, but today it's not, it's difficult, right? So we're, what we believe is the future for us is building kind of a pro tier that has some of these advanced capabilities. And the tricky part is not the technology. The tricky part is the user experience. How do I, as a user, say, yeah. this is a group of objects. I'm going to choose these certain things I want done with them. And I know that has this final cost implication. And now I'm making a buy decision, right, in that moment. Getting that to be elegant and seamless is tricky. And so we're, but we're already in the piloting stages with an AI company that, that does the chaining together part. And the question is, how does that express itself in the application elegantly? But we did not, we did not build our own AI. We are not AI experts in that sense. Uh, and we decided that if we really think about what's, we don't know, we don't know what the winners will be for each individual AI tool. So we said, what if we could connect to any of them? Then we know that the oh. thing that rises to the top for cost and value is the thing we can use. I know we're going way over. Other questions? I think there's a couple questions in chat. Okay, let me check on them. Oh, Car Carter. You had asked a question about the IPO, right? I think here. So let me see. Um, uh, to be clear, uh, there, there's no reason to believe that Canva after it IPOs will disconnect from other applications, right? Its value is enhanced by being connected to all the things that other creators want to use. Um, we don't have an agreement with that. They could terminate us and everybody else anytime they wanted. Um, but we, but our approach will be to integrate with Canva and with Adobe and with uh, Adobe Premiere Pro and with Pro Tools and with all of the other applications. In a perfect world, we would have an SDK out there, a, a developer pack, pack that allowed other developers to connect applications they like to Starchive as well, in the same way that people do with Salesforce or other things. We're just not there yet, right? We need, we've need we got to get further along in our development window. But we believe in the end, there will be an ecosystem of developers building tools on top of and adjacent to Starchive and service providers helping people do work like Rob asked about, people who feel overwhelmed and would rather hire somebody to upload all their drives. There'll be service providers in the same way that they built around most of these um, what we call the sort of core stack products for any industry. Yeah. And Richard, I just wanted to add, we do offer an API. We are, yeah. you know, we've got an internal SDK, JavaScript SDK that we use. If anyone, it, what we just don't have is this elegant developer portal that's just nice, yeah. shiny, and you can register your apps. However, if you just email either Richard at Starkive.io or Peter at Starkive.io, and you've got a Starkive already, Let's connect. We, we'll set you up with an API token so that you can connect. And you know, we're happy to share some of the SDK documentation because ultimately what we believe, and this is the difference between an application and a platform. We really believe that the, the design, the thinking behind this is engaging and creating a, um, uh, a number of different functionalities, which each together or even separately could be leveraged to do lots of different things. So Peter, you could take our AI, you could build an app, 
that says, hey, I can ta- you know, go into your star archive and you know, transcribe all your videos. And now we've got a developer app that's called the transcriber for Starchive. So we want to build that for you, obviously, so you can just, you know, do all the other things you want to do in your life. But but this idea that it's a platform, not just an application, and that anyone who is just uh, wants to get into the emergent side with us, we welcome it. We actually have, we have a number of people playing with their API and, and looking at their own integrations and building their own things with it. All right. Other questions? Comments? I don't see any hands up or mics going off. So I'll tell you what, I, I, let me just say on behalf of all of us, uh, we are super grateful for your interest. We are super grateful that you're uh, uh, considering uh, making a reservation or investing in Star Archive. Um, we're excited about connecting with you individually as, as creators, as users, as investors, and, and really, you know, uh, there are no sacred cows. We like to get the hard feedback that helps us be better. Um, uh, I will. I, I want to answer one more question that just showed up in chat to me as a direct message from Kim Sun Lee. What's the next step for Star Archive post raise? The next step is to expand our user base and focus our attention on conversions. We've been focusing f- focusing for the last year on Web three capabilities to make sure that we're compatible with this emergent category, and which we are fully compatible now. And and we wanted to make sure that we focused on growth, demonstrating that there is demand for Star Archive, even without advertising, even with that network effect we talked about in the beginning. Now that we've done that, we want to turn our attention to conversions, helping demonstrate that we can convert at least 3% of our users to paying subscribers. Uh, we've, we're already uh, over 1%, even without doing any work on that. Uh, and we're confident that engagement, the, the engagement that we see with the application indicates that the right percentage of folks will will uh, convert. But that's important for the next level, right? When we want to get to a growth round, we need to have proven, you know, venture capital is a funny thing. It's supposed to be risk-taking, but most of it is is sort of hedge betting, right? Like they want to know that you've already proven you can get it. And they're making a sort of qualified bet that with their money, they can grow you big enough to exit. Uh, and so we need to get prove that next milestone uh, over the next year. And that's that's what we're here for. Great. Thank you all. Thank you, Swami Prananda. We appreciate it. Appreciate each and every one of you for coming on. Know that you you can reach out to us personally anytime. We'll be happy to talk to you. Uh, on a one-on-one and uh, tell your friends if you're excited about it.